Thank you so much. It's really, really good to be with you. As you've heard, I'm the Bishop of Berwick, as in Berwick-upon-Tweed. It's changed hands 13 times between England and Scotland, but it's ours now. <laughs> if you want to find Berwick, head north, keep heading north, and then hold, head north some more. And just when you reach the Scottish border, uh, we're about two miles south of it. People mock northerners in this country. You wouldn't believe it, would you? We are very advanced in the north. I have to say to you, when I set off three weeks ago to travel down here, I observed all the modern facilities that we have at the station. You can park as many carts as you like outside. And one of the great benefits of being a bishop is I get free grazing for my horse until I go back. <laughs> We've got piles of coal, all that you need to run a modern railroad. It's fantastic. We've even got free education for our children, you know. Right up to the age of eight, they can go for school free of charge. And then they go down the mines. <laughs> I jest, of course, Margaret Thatcher shut all the mines. <laughs> I say it's good to be with you. It is good. Although coming to you to preach on the Day of Judgment and Hell might not be exactly the first thing that I would have thought of. Thanks, Calvin. Calvin was an old friend of mine. <laughs> we worked together in Durham as part of St. John's College, and I think perhaps this is retribution for some of the passages that together we gave to preachers. My daughter Pippa is now 17. Uh, she would have been, I guess, about 11 or so when we were driving somewhere on a Sunday morning and unusually, we hadn't managed to tie it in with going to church. And I was quite disappointed about this. And she happened to be sitting next to me in the front seat. And she said, Daddy, would you like me to preach a sermon? And I said, oh, I'd love that. And she said, well, before I preach, I've just got two things to say to you. First is an apology. I have got three points, but they don't all begin with the same letter she said. And the second thing I'd like to say to you is how delighted I was when I received this invitation to preach, but having read the passage, my heart has sunk. She came to too many of our difficult sermons at Cramner Hall. I love my kids so much. My son Jonathan is 18 years old, my daughter is 17. I don't think I will ever stop having that extraordinary love that just somehow fills a father's heart for them. I remember before Pippa was born wondering how my heart would be big enough to find love for a second child in the way that I knew love within me, but it just happens. Even now, they tend to go to sleep after me, but even now I will do that dad thing at the end of the day where you go around checking that the house is properly locked up and so on and so forth. And then before you go into your own bedroom to go to sleep, you just go into the kids' bedroom. You see them lying there in bed, as I say, often not asleep now, but they used to be sound asleep, kind of spread across like this. You do the inconsequential things of straightening up the duvet, moving the hair out of the eyes because it's long and straggly, and that's just my son's hair. <laughs> of bending over and kissing them on the forehead and of uh, saying a prayer. And I can guarantee that at some point in that kind of ritual of fatherhood, there would be the moment that happens to me every single day. And it doesn't matter whether it's been one of those days where it's been absolute heaven on earth, whether we've been on the beach in the sunshine building sandcastles or whatever it happens to be, or whether we've had one of those days, and yes, we have them in bishops' houses as well, where everything upon everything has just got on your nerves and you've been shouting at each other all day. There is something about standing there watching your sleeping child lying in front of you, and you know that there is nothing but nothing that you wouldn't do for them. It's almost as if the Lord's hand has pressed pause on the remote control of the universe, and you are rooted to the spot, and you see your child lying before you, and you know that your love for them goes far beyond anything that you could find in your human heart. It's quite extraordinary as a gift of grace. And I have to say to you, when I come to this passage to prepare this sermon for you, I notice a clunk with that kind of relational integrity which seems to me to lie behind the way that God has created the universe. And I notice it, I think, because of the way that I was brought up. 
I was born into a house where all four of my grandparents came to faith through the Plymouth Brethren movement, of which you may or may not have heard, but for which I am deeply grateful. It means I know huge chunks of the scripture off by heart because the Brethren loved their Bible. Some of it's relevant, much of it isn't. You managed to get a smarty if you learned a Bible verse. So, for example, I can tell you with absolute reliability that an omer is a tenth of an ephah because I got a smarty for it when I was three years old. But I have learned great other useful chunks of the scripture as well. I came to faith myself in the Baptist church because by that stage my parents had wandered away from the brethren and came back uh, to uh, a living faith of their own through the Baptist church here in South London. But that sense of uh, sort of premillennial uh, dread was something which surrounded my family. I remember sitting listening to my aunt describe the way that Jesus was going to come back and it was going to be for judgment. We watched those films, I don't know if you've ever seen them, called things like Taken. I remember watching as a child as two people were mowing the grass and the camera went away and then came back and the mower was carrying on going across the grass. But the person mowing the grass wasn't there and yet somebody was left behind. Will you be left behind? The question was asked to me. I see some smiles and nods of recognition and this sense of fear will I be left behind is something that has lived with me in fact even this morning as I was journeying here this morning I put the following on Instagram which is probably slightly uh, too small to read but this is North Ealing station and the text oh there you go magic technology (laughs) are tube stations ever this deserted just checking the rapture hasn't taken place (laughs) Particularly given I'm preaching on it coming like a thief in the night at LST in a couple of hours' time. And although I'm joking, actually there is something about that fear that kind of still lives inside me. The older I get, the more I recognize, you know, that fear is a very odd kind of faith. And actually I want to say to you it's quite an anti-kingdom type of faith. That fear that is a settled belief that things will go wrong if they can go wrong actually stands in stark contrast to the relationship into which God calls us in our Lord Jesus Christ. Perfect love, the apostle writes, drives out fear. The kingdom of God is a kingdom of hope, of forgiveness, of peace, of joy. deals with hugely serious things, as we will cover in just a moment. But it is not a kingdom of fearfulness. We are called into life and hope. Therefore, writes St. Paul, encourage one another with these words. So let's come to the passage which was read uh, to us just a moment ago. What does it say? Is this good news or is it bad news? Or perhaps even worse, is it no news at all, at least in the way that we live it? Well, is it bad news? Actually, yes, if you don't know and love the Lord Jesus Christ. This passage is really serious. It tells of a day when the Lord will return and when those who do not know him will face destruction. God has not destined us for wrath, Paul says in chapter 5, verse 9, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, whether we are awake or asleep. This is good news, as we will say in a moment, for those who believe. But let's notice that with the good news comes a solemn warning. And with that comes an urgency for you and me as we trust and believe in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. There are 811,000 people who live in the Diocese of Newcastle for which I have responsibility according to the last census. Somewhere, depending on whether you're an optimist or a pessimist, between 2 and 4% of them have any kind of explicit, visible, living faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That means that over 700,000 people on my watch will go to sleep tonight without knowing the love, hope, joy, and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ. The great sentinel of knowledge, which is Wikipedia, 
tells me there are 22,500 people who live in Northwood. My geography is not brilliant, but I think we are somewhere near Northwood. If we take the common figure and reckon that 3% of them may have some swarm of faith, that means within just a few miles of where we sit right now, there are 21,800 people who, if the Lord returns tonight, will not find themselves headed for that eternal rest, peace, life that we look forward to in our Lord Jesus Christ. And just as seriously, find themselves living in this day in a state which is unforgiven, which does not revel in the peace and joy and hope that we know through Christ. My friends, what do you dream of doing when you leave this great school of theology? What fantasies do you uh, just cherish in the nighttime about the ministries to which you are called? Let me dare to suggest that if your dreams are anything other than going to the very ends of the earth, to the least and to the lowest and to the lost, in order that by God's grace just one more person can find salvation, then perhaps you, like me, need to take your dreams and crucify them daily that Christ might truly be glorified. As we travel on the bus, as we walk around our streets, our hearts should be full of the urgency of the bad news of this passage, as well as of the urgency of the good news of this passage. We have no more pressing task and you and I are conscripted into this, not into the popular areas, but to the least and the lowest and the lost, whom God loves more than we can imagine. So let's be real. There is bad news in this passage, but there is also fantastic news, the greatest of news. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation. We are not in darkness. Chapter 5, verse 4, brothers and sisters, this day will not come to surprise us like a thief. We are children of light, children of the day. Christ will return and will take us to be with him. And we shall come back to this in just a moment. Because before we do, there is one other danger that we need to observe. And I always like to get the hard stuff out the way at the beginning. Bad news, good news, but do you know the problem with this passage is that too often for the likes of you and me in a modern and wealthy church, this passage ends up being no news at all. It's a kind of inconvenient ending to this epistle to the church at Thessalonica. It's a kind of reminder that we have to come back to. And if you, like me, are in a church that says the creed, it kind of pops up day by day. He will return again. But actually, we live as if that's not very likely to be today. We live as if we know that it will happen in the future, but it's kind of like our own death. We sort of know it's there, but polite people don't talk about it. We live as if... The fact that Christ does not return for 2019 years means he's not very likely to return today or even this year. And the problem with this is it leads us to rely on our own omnicompetence. As if in our own strength we can do all that the Lord calls us to do. We've got a project that we want to do to reach out and reach the lost. Let's raise some money. Let's invest in good training. Let's learn the latest techniques with social media and communication and so on and so forth. And please, all of those things matter. It's just that none of them matter a jot compared to the facts, or the question rather, of whether we are seeking the will and the way of the Lord Jesus Christ, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord, as the Old Testament prophet reminds us day by day. I observe in my own heart, and therefore I hazard to guess that there might be some little whiff of it, even in your heart, that this functional atheism is a blight, is a cancer in the modern church. 
let me invite you just to search your heart and ask what you worry about in this day. I'm told, I believe it to be true because people like Calvin tell me that it's true, that when John Wesley was on his way across to America, there was a great storm in a boat and John Wesley couldn't sleep at night. I believe there were Mennonites on the boat with him. And John Wesley asked them, how do you sleep at night? And their response led him to the place where he realized that they trusted God and he didn't. What do you worry about? And if you think about the things that you worry about, actually, how often do you actually pray about them? I am astonished and ashamed at the times when I need to beat myself around the face with a wet fish. I live in the north. Because I've been worrying about something and wrestling about it and working hard about it for days and sometimes even weeks before the little voice says, why have you not bent the knee? Why have you not brought this to me in prayer? Song that I brought, was brought up on because I'm that old. Have we troubles and temptations? Are there trials anywhere? Take it to the Lord in prayer. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Now, too often, this passage actually is an inconvenience, one that we know is there, but we do not live with day by day. Bad news? Yes. Great news? Absolutely. No news. Allow this to search your soul. Why, then, is this great news? Well, two things that I think the Apostle seems very keen to communicate. Firstly, our hope. And secondly, how we are to live in this intervening time, looking forward to the day when Christ will return in this time of now and not yet. Firstly, let's consider the hope that we have. Christ will come back. This return will happen. It will be real, it will be bodily, and every eye on earth will see it. Every knee will bow before our returning Lord Jesus Christ. The one who became incarnate and was born in Bethlehem in Judea will return in all his glory. And more than that, his death and his resurrection will be utterly sufficient in that day. He will descend from heaven, verse 16, with a cry of command, the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, we who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. It will happen. And his death and resurrection is sufficient. You will be saved with all those who call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Why has Jesus not yet returned? Well, Peter tells us because the Lord is patient and he does not want anyone to perish. When will he return? We do not know, but he will come like a thief in the night. The fact that he has not come yet is simply evidence of his patience and his grace, not evidence that this will not happen. Why, the first century Christians were asking, have some already died then because many believe that Jesus would return before they themselves died? Because this timing is in God's hands, St. Paul says. Because God alone is gracious and his death is sufficient not just for those who are living, but also for those who have already passed. Will they go first? No, we will be caught up with them. Death itself is nothing in this great economy of the kingdom of God because Christ's death and resurrection is all sufficient. I forget the exact reference, but there's a lovely verse in the Psalms which you can send to anybody who's just had a new child very much on this theme. Do you know this? It says, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. (laughs) Death itself is nothing in the light of the death and resurrection of Christ. As Paul tells us in the 15th chapter of the first epistle to to the church in Corinth, Christ has conquered death, that last great enemy. Therefore, chapter 4, verse 13, we have this hope. Those who have no hope grieve, but we have hope. Just a pastoral note, 
It's easy and right to say that death is nothing at all in the economy of the one who died and raised. Actually, that doesn't mean that we don't grieve, if I can do a double negative, when we lose those whom we love. The fact that we have loved them means that when we lose them, even though we know it's temporary, it is still painful. It's a different level of grief that Paul is talking about here. He's talking about being able to grieve with the hope that we will one day be reunited. Please don't feel guilty and please don't preach a gospel that is kind of a a, a pretend one because it will hurt. I'm reminded of the lovely limerick about a Christian scientist church. You'll know uh, that... um, uh, the, the Christian scientists believe that pain isn't real. Uh, but uh, uh, well, let me just see if I can start it, if I can come to mind, because it's just occurred to me, it's not in my notes. A Christian scientist from Deal said, I know that pain isn't real, but when I sit on a pin and it punctures my skin, I dislike what I fancy I feel. <laughs> no, it's painful. But we hold even our pain in the reality of the hope that Christ gives us. So we encourage one another, verse 18 of chapter 4. So we rest in the assurance that Christ's death is sufficient, verses 9 and 10 of chapter 5. And so we encourage and build one another up, verse 11 of chapter 5. So how do we live in this light, in this veil of tears, in this time of now and not yet? Well, I want to suggest to you that the clue is in verse 5 of chapter 5. You are children of of light. We live as children, those who know in part but will one day know in full, those who are able to live in trust because we know that our God is all-sufficient and all-knowing. One of my greatest prayers for UK Christians, particularly UK Anglicans, is that we can rediscover this gift of the fatherhood of God despite the breakdown of fatherhood in our nation. I think of my lovely Ugandan friend, Francis Wainaina, a priest in the Church of England, now retired, who every time I would pray with him, and I've prayed often with him, would be laying his hands on somebody's shoulder and would be joining in with every word that you prayed. And several times in every prayer would be saying, Yes, Dad! Yes, Dad! Oh, Dad, yes, please! It's shocking to an Anglican culture where, although it might not look like it, I am dressed down in order to be with you today. But he is absolutely spot on right. It's not even just a father theology. It is a Dad theology. It is a theology that says we can approach God who is almighty and call him Abba, Papa, Pops, Dad. It's that freedom of being able to love and live and obey that brings life and liberty in the now, looking forward to the certainty that Christ will return, enabling us to live in the uncertainty of now. Do you remember that great story in the 15th chapter of the Gospel according to Luke? Father, two sons, younger son comes to the dad and says, Dad, can I have my inheritance now? He takes his inheritance, goes off, and as the New International Version put it, I love the way the Scriptures translate some of this, he squanders his wealth in wild living. I just think it's great. He goes and splurges it or wastes it, doesn't it? But what does the text say? When he came to his senses, he said to himself, how many of my father's hired men have food to spare? I will return to my father and I will say, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. Make me like one of your hired men. And so he sets off to journey back. And where's the father? He's not sitting in the counting house. He's not fuming in the dining room at this wretched younger son. He is looking and longing and yearning for the return of the reprobate. When he sees his son, even a long way off, he tucks his garments into his loins and he goes hurtling across the fields in order that he can get to his son just one second sooner than if he had run even a little slower. 
His son sees him coming. You can only imagine the fear that he must have felt at the father running towards him because fathers never ran in this culture. And the son flings himself to his knees. He says, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. And his father gets out his wet fish because he's also from the north and slaps him around the face. And he says, will you shut up and give me a hug? For this son of mine was dead, but now he's alive. He was lost, but now he's found quick. Bring him the colored robes. It's why we wear these kind of things, you know. (laughs) Gill the fattened calf, put a new ring on his finger. For my son is home. And the elder son, which incidentally, if you come from a tradition like mine, where we have three orders of ministry, diakonos, presbyteroi, and episkopos, is slightly worrying because the word for the older son in Luke 15 is presbyteros, which we need to remember whatever type of ministry we're called into. The elder son looks on with disdain and breaks the father's heart afresh. I'm a bit weird, you've probably worked that out uh, by now. But I found myself a few years ago asking the question, what happened the morning after all of this? I mean, I know it was a first century Jewish party, so it went on for a week. But just imagine it was a polite British Church of England party, so it finished at 11.30. (laughs) What happened the next day? Because we love the story that I've just told you. You could tell it to me just as eloquently as I hope I can tell it to you. But we live as if the story continued in this way. 11.30, everyone disappears upstairs, leaving as much of the washing up as they possibly can till tomorrow morning. And they collapse into bed. And the night goes far too quickly And at six o'clock the next morning, the younger son is lying in bed. He was a teenager, after all. When all of a sudden, there is the most, it's rather more impressive when there's a microphone on the lectern, most almighty bashing at his door. And the father who has rejoiced the night before is suddenly full of anger and retribution. Right, you horrible boy, he says. You've had your party and your home. Now we need to start rebuilding the family business. You've got precisely five minutes, and then here's your work schedule for today. Task number one, run the Sunday school for 437 years. Or whatever it happens to be. For I observe, at least in the part of the church that I'm part of, we talk about salvation by grace and then ongoing sanctification by works, that we urge ourselves day by day to work harder, to be more disciplined, as if our ongoing relationship with Christ only depended on our own effort. Is this just me? Because it matters, you see. But I think we fall into a myth of modernity if we think that this is the second half of this story. And the myth cannot be right because it's not the shape or the story that the scriptures tell. Let me tell you what I think actually happened the next morning. I'm no writer of the scriptures, but let me tell you what seems to me to be a far more likely ending to that story. I suspect they probably did go to bed at 11.30 or so. I suspect that come six o'clock the next morning, the younger son probably was lying in bed because he was a teenager, absolutely fast asleep. I suspect at six o'clock the next morning, there probably was a knock on the door. Because this is a working farm. But the other side of the door was a nervous father clutching two mugs of strong black coffee. I suspect he pushed the door open and said, can I come in? And pretended not to notice the dreadful odor that was in the teenager's room, despite the fact he'd only been asleep in there for six hours. I suspect he picked his way through the clothes that somehow had got strewn over the floor and sat down on the side of the bed and said, son, I bought coffee. I hope you still like it this way. And I've got some of my old overalls here because I hope that you're willing to come out with me today because there's a whole load of stuff I want to do with you. Some fences need repairing and whatever tasks you can imagine need to be done on the farm. And I suspect the son who had woken in fear 
couldn't believe the invitation of grace that the Father was extending to him. And I suspect that day he worked far harder than he had ever worked when he was feeding the pigs, and perhaps far harder than he'd ever worked back on the home farm before he first left. But it didn't feel like a moment's effort because he was right alongside the Father, with the Father, doing the things that the Father was inviting him to do. I suspect that they laughed and they cried and they talked in a way that they had never talked before. I suspect that they sweated and dropped things and perhaps even said the odd rude word and laughed about it because here was genuine, deep, father-son relationship, the like of which the son had never imagined possible and if only he had glimpsed, he never would have left. And I suspect somewhere over the fields, the older son was looking on with utmost disdain, but just a hint that perhaps he was missing out. And I suspect that the father, as he walked across the room and saw his younger son sleeping in bed in that moment, felt like the universe had paused Time itself had stood still and knew in that moment that the love that he had really could rewrite the future and heal the past. For that's the kind of relationship that we are invited into. That's the kind of relationship that we are commissioned to take beyond these walls to the people we meet on the bus who sell us our groceries in the stores, to the people that we go and play sport with, to those that we will go to the very ends of the earth in order to persuade them that Christ has come, that they might live. This is the good news of this passage. For Christ will return. And we too will find ourselves in that place of life and love and hope. And if you want to live it faithfully, open your eyes, smell the coffee, pull on the Father's overalls, and let's work together as we look forward in hope. In his name. Amen.